prayer in that you can come to me anytime and I'll pray for you concerning snow. If you will turn to me, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses uh, 25 to 40, we will be continuing our sermon series on the church and how we are to interact with each other, how we are to uh, treat our brothers and sisters, how we are to treat the church of Christ, and so forth. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 40. <clears throat> Verse 25, it says this. Now concerning the betroth, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if you have betrothed a woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as, they, as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried and the betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let him marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. This is the Word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we come in front of your majestic throne, we look upon the one who is sitting upon that throne. It is he who is sitting who is majestic. It is he who is holy. It is he who is true. And so, Father, as we come to worship you through the study of your word, through the hearing of your word, Father, let our hearts be ready and open to receive this bread to receive the living waters of your Son, to receive the guidance of the Spirit, to transform our hearts as well as our minds, to see the things of the world the way that the Lord does. Father God, I pray for understanding. I pray that this word will impact our lives in a way not only that we will use it, but also so that we can share this truth, to share this bread to the others in our lives as well. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Use me as a humble tool to just teach your word today. And Father, let all glory and honor go to you. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So, uh, a couple years ago, at uh, in my previous church, I had to counsel a girl uh, concerning her relationship with her boyfriend. And there would be nights where she would text me at 11 o'clock p.m., you know, right as I was sleeping, and it wakes me up. And she's obviously upset because, you know, the guy was, like, causing problems and he would not be there for her. And in her words, you know, he doesn't understand me. And not only that, her friends would be giving her trouble because it felt like she was spending a lot of time with this guy. And her friends got jealous and they would, like, make fun of her and all these things. And so she always came to me in, like, a lot of distraught, just, like, crying sometimes and, like, you know, Pastor Terry, what do I do? What do I do with these things? My advice to her every single time was, you need to break up. 
And although it was kind of difficult, you know, for me to say something like that and for her to possibly accept that, I told her, you need to break up because uh, right now you need to live your life. And I strongly believe dating right now for you is not appropriate. I want you to finish sixth grade and I want you to date, uh, you know, when you're 25, right? Think about that later. <laughs> Today we live in a world where... Uh, the drive to date, the drive to find somebody, that special somebody, even reaches down to elementary level, where even the participants, the ones who seek someone, don't even realize why they're doing it. They don't even realize or understand the process of doing so, and yet they will do it either to find acceptance with, among their peers or even among their parents. Many of us are driven in life based on what we will receive in the future. Some of us work hard now in hopes that we will receive more later on. We spoke about this last week in terms of being faithful to what has been given to you today and not being anxious for tomorrow. But there are still plenty of people who work, give their entire sweat and blood for comfort in the future for nice things, for bigger things, for better things. The question that I would like to introduce our message for today is this. How much of today is driven by what we may possibly get tomorrow? A better tomorrow, a greater tomorrow. Whether it's money, comfort, relationships, are we so driven by what we may get tomorrow and miss out on the potential blessings of today? How many parents today have come to me and cried and complained of, my kids are growing too fast. Is it possible that you're so focused about their tomorrow, their future, that you forget about their today? Today's message is kind of a tricky one because how we perceive certain things, especially for this passage for today, will totally alter and influence the way that we look at our relationships, marriage, and dating. What we learn out of this passage today will affect how we pursue relationships, how will we continue relationships, and even endure the ones that God has given us. And so let's go together, especially with such a popular topic today in the media and in the world of dating, relationships, marriage, things that people do think about even at a young age, and see what the Lord says about those type of things. In our passage, Paul begins by reiterating his humble opinion that it is good for a person to remain as he is. This is not a set in stone commandment from God, and he points that out in his verse, but he, it is his humble opinion that due to the current circumstances of the Corinthian church, it is better for a person to remain as he is. For uh, your history buffs out there, during this time, as Paul was writing this letter, Corinth was dealing with the famine. And uh, those who were married were obviously having more difficulty in their life because they had extra mouths to feed and food was, you know, tough to come by. And, you know, those who were married were actually considering of splitting up from their wives or their spouses because of how difficult it was to survive during that time. Paul says, those who are married do not divorce from each other. Don't do it just because you think it will make it easier for yourself. Not only that, those who are single try not to pursue relationships because of the moment of distress right now. Be faithful, be happy, be content with what has been given to you right now. But then he goes on to this poetic discourse where he begins where he says, the appointed time has now grown very short. Let those who have wives live as though they had none. Those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And he keeps on going with all these duets. Well, Paul, what do you mean? I mean, isn't this the same Paul who said, if you have a burning passion in your heart, go ahead and get married. It's not a wrong thing to do. How, why would you say those who have wives live as, they, as though they did not have any at all? So I want you guys to skim through verses 29 and 31 real quickly again. And I want you guys to notice a pattern of how they are all pointing to the same truth of heavenly priorities. For those who are married, despite the importance of marriage, your relationship with the Lord is more important than your marriage. Those who may be mourning over something, grieving over something, 
It is hard. It is difficult. I know it's sad. But because of the time is short, think of the Lord. For those who buy goods, live as though you had no goods. Be a steward of what the Lord has given you. Because everything that you own today will eventually pass away, will it not? Use the world as a tool to carry out the work of the kingdom of God, is what Paul is saying. Let it never control you, but use it wisely. Because the amount of time we have on this earth, how long do we have? As a, as a kid, you know, I always thought it would be useful if God gave us this watch that showed us how much time we had left on this earth. You know, because I would think, you know, if I had, and let's look, look at this watch right here, and I said, oh, I have 50 days left to live. You know? And I would assume that, oh, because if I knew exactly the day that I would die, maybe I would use my time more effectively. And that was my thought process. Uh, you know, as I grew up and, you know, became a pastor and matured in the faith, I realized that that's probably a bad idea. Because due to our sinfulness and due to our wicked hearts, we would probably procrastinate until the very last day, <laughs> partying and doing all that we want, and then on our deathbed, you know, profess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. The Lord purposely keeps certain things a secret because when it is hidden, when we do not know exactly when the day is, there is that sense of urgency of what we need to be doing here on this earth. If we knew when exactly the Lord will return here on this earth someday, I guarantee, including myself, we would abuse that time that would be given to us. On one side, I'd be happy if I knew that Jesus was returning tomorrow, I'd be celebrating right now. But again, in my wickedness, I know I would be probably sinning until the last minute that Christ would return. Paul is trying to show that, show that to us today. Because of the importance of the unknown time here we have on earth, will you consider your heavenly priorities, especially when it comes to marriage, relationships, buying things, living here? Ephesians 5, 15, 16 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Paul is saying, time is not our ally. Time is not on our side. Many of us who, would, you know, who lead busy lives would probably love an extra hour. I would for sleep. Maybe they would like another hour with the kids or even for work to finish things at their jobs. But the time that we have been given today is what the Lord has given us in His sovereignty and in His wisdom. Paul states, I want you to be free of these anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord because they are not in a relationship. They don't have to care about dates, buying stuff, buying presents for birthdays, holidays. They can focus truthfully, 100% on the things of God. Those who are married are in relationships. Their attention is divided. Unfortunately, today, a lot of people will use this, uh, use these verses to support the idea of celibacy and how singleness is better than marriage. I don't necessarily view it that way. I view it as they're simply different. But... Let us see what Paul is really trying to say in this passage. Paul himself was celibate. He never married. And I think there is no question when we read scripture that there is no lack of love for the Lord when it comes to Paul. Out of all the characters in the New Testament, I would say Paul is probably the most passionate apostle for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Right? He dedicated his life in singleness, planting churches, going through persecution, going through much hardship, being in jail many, many times, everything he, you know, he did was for the Lord. That was his calling. And so some people, they look at that and they're like, man, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could be like Paul. I can be single and just totally dedicate my life to the Lord. But here's the deal. 
I do believe there are people like that. I have met some of them before too. And there are awesome people of God. But out of my short life here on earth, I believe a lot of people are not celibate. I don't think, and I don't say this to insult anyone, I don't think there's many Pauls. I think Paul was one of a kind type of guy. I'm not saying that these people are not faithful. What I'm simply saying is, celibacy is a very rare thing. And I mentioned that before. Even Paul himself says that. Because look at verse 7 in our passage today. He says, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of a kind, one of one kind, and one of another. Paul, even though he was celibate himself, even though he wanted others to be like him, he realizes not everyone is gifted that way. And so, for those who may have read Joshua Harris's book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, which is an okay book, Will you please consider whether or not your drive for celibacy, for singleness, is truly from the Lord, or if it's something that you have put upon yourself? Paul wishes that everybody could be a celibate like him. He wishes that everybody could totally dedicate their entire lives for the kingdom of God. But he realizes not everyone is gifted that way. Just like how not everyone is the eye, not everybody is the mouth of the church, some people are gifted with celibacy, and some people are not. However, look at verse 36. If anyone believe, thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin. Marriage is not a sin. That's it. The Greek uh, for this verse, verses 36, is kind of ambiguous because some translations, depending on what translation you have for your Bible, uh, it will translate it as your fiancé. Some translations will say your father's daughter. Right? Uh, during this time, prearranged marriages was a pretty common thing. And many uh, Christians from Corinth were dealing with the issue of whether or not they should follow through with the prearranged marriage that their parents gave them. All right? So it's like they were arranged to be married. All right? They were engaged, but because of the famine and because Paul is showing them you know, it's okay to be single and still worry on the Lord, they were like, hmm, maybe I should call off the marriage then. Maybe I should not get married at all and just dedicate my life to the Lord. And Paul is showing them, look, no, don't make a big deal out of it. Live according to what has been called to you. If you are engaged and you feel that you want to get married and you have passion in your heart to get married, get married. It is not a sin. However, if you are truly in a situation where you can handle being single for the rest of your life, possibly, then go ahead and do that because you can serve the Lord fully with no anxiety, with no distractions. Paul is saying, just like we talked about in the past week, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. How do you know what is beneficial to you? As I read this uh, passage and I studied this week, one thing I realize is when it comes to something as complicated as relationships and marriage, we really shouldn't be seeking a generalized answer. I wish there was a book that specifically said, chapter one or chapter five, specifically, this is how you deal with so-and-so. But something as important and crazy as two people coming together as one should not seek a generic answer, an all-encompassing answer, I think this is truly one of those things where we must trust the Lord, pray over these things, get counsel from other saints, and really make a judgment based on those things. I, I'm sorry, I wish I could give you a simpler answer when it comes to relationships, especially for those of you who may be dealing with this type of issue today. But what has the Lord given you? What has the Lord given you? We talked about that last week. What has the Lord given you today? 
Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Because being faithful to what has been given to you today is already a lot of work, is it not? <clears throat> In the final part of our passage today, verses 39 to 40, a wife is bound to her husband as long as, she live, as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Paul closes this chapter by reminding people of the magnitude of marriage. Just like how we've been going over the past couple of weeks, the bond that two people have in marriage a bond that can only be broken when one of them dies Paul is showing us here for those who think about dating who are single right now but unfortunately worry about marriage worry about dating worry about all these things every day will you stop and think about truly what you are seeking Will you stop and really assess how big marriage is? He's, he's even saying, look, if a person gets widowed, if a woman becomes widowed, consider staying single. Because in his humble opinion, she will be happier that way. Even though, you know, it's not a commandment from God, it is a trustworthy opinion. It's from Paul the Apostle. As we've gone over the various types of relationships in the church in the past couple of weeks, will you reflect on where you stand now? If you are single, enjoy your singleness. The days are evil. And if we had a record of how we spent our days, and we were able to see exactly what we did each day, how much of that time, of that calendar, would be based on, oh, I wish I was married. I wish I was dating somebody. Paul's saying, look, the life that has been given to us through Christ, the new life where we can have fellowship with the Lord, the time that has been given to us today, when we pray and we say, thank you, Lord, for today, that is precious. It is a gift from the Lord. How will you use that time? How will you be faithful? Or will you drown in your sorrows thinking about, oh, I wish I was in a relationship. Oh, I wish I was out of this relationship. Paul saying, be faithful. God has given you this because it comes down to this church. And this is my humble opinion. Your life does not begin after you find somebody. Your life does not begin after you get married. Your life does not begin after you have kids. No matter what your parents may say, no matter what your peers may say or think about you, your life does not begin after you do something for them. Your life begins after you hear the calling from our Lord on what he wants you to do today. Once you recognize what God has called you to do, if part of those plans involve not getting married for a long time, will you be faithful to that? Look at the dangers of those who are so desperate to seek a relationship or marriage, thinking that it will fulfill their loneliness and issues that they may have, that in their desperation, they're willing to give up certain standards in a marriage just so they can have somebody to be with. Whether it's to date an unbeliever, whether it's to date somebody who will distract you from the kingdom of God, sometimes we fall into that trap thinking, as long as I have this, once I accomplish this, then I can start serving God. Sometimes people believe that they can change the hearts of another person as long as they keep on teaching them. Missionary dating, we said that already. 
but who but the Lord, only the Lord can change the heart of another. We cannot fall for those traps. We cannot think and justify that our plans are greater than his. For those of you who are single today and have a desire to marry, what are some of the poor reasons to get married? Marrying a non-believer, marrying someone who will bring you down spiritually, making you forget about the Lord, distracting you. Be careful. Seeking marriage is not a bad thing. But do not give up your standards when seeking someone. But also, do not reject marriage entirely, thinking that we have this false calling of celibacy. You must be honest with yourself. If you have a passion, a normal, natural, God-given passion to be married, that is a good thing. But get married according to the Lord's time. In fact, through marriage itself, you serve the Lord in various different ways. Church, I'm sorry that I cannot give you a panacea answer to everything. But this shows us when it comes to something important as marriage, dating, things like that. It shows us that we cannot depend on those general answers. It is one of those things where we must trust the Lord and seek His guidance daily. If the Lord has made you single today, what are you using your singleness for right now? How are you preparing yourself to be a worthy spouse worth being married in the future? For those who seek marriage, how are you learning to sacrifice yourself? for another person? How are you learning to give up things in your life to follow and to be committed to that person? How are you showing Christ in your life today? And how you bring that into a potential marriage in the future? Church, I encourage you today to look at the plans of the Lord and be faithful to them. Do not fear the pressures of people. Do not fear man but fear God. Trust in Him. Follow His commandments. Be faithful to Him. Will you love Christ first? And if, you're, if you are, and if you're strong in that love, things like marriage and dating will not seem important. Today, church, I encourage you, your life does not begin after you get married. Your life begins when you seek Him and is calling for you today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, when we think about something like dating and relationships and marriage, it is definitely something that comes up quite often. It is something that the world will say is extremely important and it's something that some people may even think about that if you're not married, something's wrong with you. Father, these are the type of lies that exist in our society today. And Lord, I pray for a guarding of our hearts and our minds that we do not believe in those lies. That Father, that if we have been called to be single today, we simply be faithful to that calling. And we thank you for the time that you have given us in our singleness. Lord, for those who are married today, again, the same question applies. How are we being faithful to our marriage? Do I love my spouse? Do I sacrifice? Do I show Christ? Do I purify her or him through the words of your truth? Lord, as your word says, the days are evil. Will you give us a heart of urgency to consider the things of the kingdom, to first seek you above even our marriages, dating, relationships. Father God, give us that type of love for you so that it will be easy to give up those things for your kingdom. And Lord, 
I do pray specifically for those here who have been going through something like this for a long time. Father, remind them and encourage them that you are with them, that the Spirit is working in their hearts, and it is there to counsel them and comfort them. Show them, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for them. Teach them what that means and make it clear to them they're calling for your kingdom. Father, I thank you that it is you alone that can fully satisfy. Will you teach us and show us what that means daily in our lives? Lord, thank you. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. You can continue to reflect.